So I'm going to speak today about Russian folklore and uh, something I imagine everyone knows a little bit about, but it's not as well known as other kinds of folklore outside of Russian families or people who study Russian. And it's part of what my folklore professor in graduate school called the old traditional way of life. So those include folk ways like farming traditions, uh, clothing, dances, birth rituals, wedding rituals, death rituals, architecture, uh, how houses are built, how houses are um, kept up, how wooden churches are built, that kind of thing. And uh, here's an example, uh, especially in places where there were, wasn't um, serfdom. So here are a few pictures from the island of Kiji. Kiji is located in Lake Anega, Anyaga. If you look at a map of the Russian Federation, you see Lake Ladoga kind of round next to St. Petersburg. And then further up, there's a, a more narrow one with fingers at the top, and that's Lake Anyaga. And so in the northwest of Russia, there was no serfdom in Karelia because the land is poor. It was scraped by glaciers. And this UNESCO Heritage Museum in Kijri is best known for the incredible complex of wooden churches that were built on the site. But it also holds, forgive me for this blurred image, but you get an idea. It holds a number of peasant houses or izby that were moved there from elsewhere for the museum. So the one you see on your right was clearly a wealthy peasant family. The barn actually was the first floor. So if you look at the first floor, you see that there's some, um, if you can make it out sort of towards the left, uh, a very plain looking door. So there the cattle and the other livestock would spend the long cold winter because it was really too long and too cold without enough accessible food for the livestock to survive. And the family lived upstairs where you see the um, windows that are actually glazed and this beautiful little balcony on top. So it's typical that preservation happens to the big fancy houses and that's a lot like similar museums in the US where smaller structures might be torn down to improve the view of the big house. So this is clearly a very wealthy peasant family. Other kinds of folkways would include farming knowledge. So a lot of Karelia has lakes. It's very, oops, um, very, very lakey. It's kind of like uh, Minnesota. And so uh, people who lived in villages on the sides of the lakes would keep their cows further up the hill from the lake so that their manure wouldn't uh, go down and pollute it and could be gathered for fertilizer while the calves were kept closer to the lake since they were not producing as much manure. Now folklore proper is what gets passed down orally. And so lore, right, the word lore. And interestingly, Russian and many other languages have taken the English expression in Russian, it's folklore. And it is culture, so people can want to call it folk literature, but literature, just the name tells you that it's made of letters, right, litera. And letters are a system for recording speech on some kind of surface. For example, there were birch bark documents found around Novgorod from the Kievan period of history, and people just scratched onto birch bark, and then it was like a little note or a, an IOU, and then threw it into the ground, which was swampy and acidic, and preserved it. So it's been very exciting for archaeologists to dig these up. Now, the terms I've put here along uh, parts of folklore proper are not the terms that actual people who carry this lore and pass it down to the next generation would use when they talked about it. Rather, these are the ones used by specialists who study that. Many of these genres are no longer living, and so what we have was collected in earlier years. Now too many people are literate, and they read these things in books instead of learning them from their surroundings. And a lot of things happened, a series of things happened in Russia to cause this. First, in the beginning, there was folklore all up and down the social scale, although with a lot of local variation because it's just enormous spaces, huge geography. Then in the early 18th century, Peter I, known as the Great, declared that nobles who were one of the four traditional estates of Muscovite society, along with clergy, merchants, and peasants, so he said nobles had to adopt West European clothing. They had to serve the government uh, by serving in the military or else in the bureaucracy. They had to educate their sons rather than just letting them go out and hunt 
And they had to attend court on a regular basis. So they had to come uh, either to Moscow, which was the traditional capital, or else to St. Petersburg, the new capital that Peter built. And so as the Russian Empire, so the Russian Empire dates from 1721, when Peter declared that it was in fact an empire, and as it modernized, it turned out that a lot of the peasants who were the main carriers of folklore liked city clothes. They didn't want to wear the, the folky clothes, and they liked the traveling musicians who came to town and played something that might sound to us like klezmer music. And literacy was also spreading, although slowly. So this tended to uh, create a population that wasn't carrying folklore any longer, that they didn't, because they could read, they no longer had the strategies of oral memorization, which are quite different. Then you get the revolution, for the most part, uh, peasants, people who weren't part of the elite, were very much in favor of the revolution. And unfortunately, then in the late 1920s, the trauma of collectivization in the Soviet Union. So a lot of the peasant communities were uprooted, the older men were shot, the ones who lived in houses like the one I showed you were considered kulaks, they were too wealthy. And so like arist aristocrats needed to be deprived and, and um, either killed or sent away. And the last thing that happened in the Soviet period, right about the same in the 1930s, is that certain kinds of folklore were co-opted by the Soviet state. So talking about oral composition, and I'm just going to take epic songs as an example, the classic work about oral composition is this book by Albert Lord, The Singer of Tales. This is the cover of the third edition. So Lord was a graduate student working with Milman Parry. They went to the Balkans in the 1930s and late 20s, and they found a living epic song tradition because they were looking for people doing what Homer did. They recorded a lot of singers on aluminum discs, which you can still go here if you go to the, the Albert Lord archive, or I think it's the Milman Perry archive at Harvard University. They found by um, recording and then listening again to these singers that there are standard devices and phrases that would repeat and they would help the singer remember. So if you've read Homer in translation, one example is the wine dark sea. You hear about the wine dark sea and the performer would adjust what the performance was depending on how much time there was and how the audience was reacting. So cut it short or add a bunch of elaboration. Now, folk singers or anybody who was informing scholars or collectors would say that every single time they did it the same. And for a short piece, it might be the same. So folk songs, for example, they rhyme, they're easy to remember. Think about all the songs that you've learned without even trying to learn them just because you sang along. Um, short magical charms or sayings, proverbs are easy to repeat verbatim. But the longer pieces followed these rules of oral composition. So Epic songs were in fact recorded supposedly by Kirsha Danilov. Scholars wonder, was that really the person who did it? And this was recorded in the 18th century, although not published until 1804. So here's a page from the first publication. And it's because they were hard to decipher. You can see indeed that they were hard to decipher. But um, lines of text from these recordings were used by Russian authors, and bits of melody were used by composers. Rimsky-Korsakov used some of the melodies from Danilov's collection in his opera Sadko, which was based on a folk epic from the Novgorod cycle. And later on, later in the 19th century, uh, people visiting discovered that there was a live epic tradition in Karelia, and I'm going to talk a lot about Karelia just because I was there and it had a particularly interesting history with folklore. It's far away from the big cities. It's a pretty cold climate. Imagine long summer nights where you can't sleep, it's too light, or long winter nights where you can't sleep the whole time because it's, it's dark and you can't do anything else. But also, the ethnic Russians who lived there were the heirs of people who had lived in the Kievan state, in Rus, as it was known, before the Mongol invasions. And they preserved both the Vladimir cycle from Kiev. Uh, Prince Vladimir becomes a hero, kind of like King Arthur in um, British folklore. And then the Novgorod epics, I mentioned Sadko, he's one of the heroes. And the heroes in Novgorod were uh, not princes, but merchants. And these uh, 
yeah, these recordings were made long, uh, late enough, the discovery was made late enough that you can go to YouTube and hear Mr. Trafim Grigorievich Rybinin, here he is, from a recording on a wax cylinder. And I'm not going to play that for you because the quality isn't very good, a lot of hiss, but uh, he was a huge hit and traveled around performing and the Rybinin family and then um, daughters married into another family, they continued performing um, had the the habit, they had the technique, and and so the whole family kind of went into the business. Now collectivization hit everywhere hard. Again, this is the 1929-1930 or so, and Soviet folklorists who wanted to keep their jobs encouraged the latest uh, generation of epic singers. So from the Rybinian family, there weren't many others. Um, the places where Kirsha Danilov had been collecting had already become more industrialized and they, they no longer had that tradition as a living thing. So the folklorists wanted to keep their jobs. They encouraged the latest epic singers to compose what they called Navini. So this is um, from the word Novi and Novi related to the word Nova or novel um, out of Latin. So these were epic songs that used the traditional formulae they would call a hero a fine young falcon, but the hero now is Lenin or ugh, Stalin as the hero. And so this turned out to be the end of the tradition. After Stalin died, it was quickly denounced as fake lore. And so fake lore wouldn't be what they said in uh, the Soviet Union. This is Richard Dorson's term for made up, uh, made up stories that are sold to readers, sold to students as being actual folklore. So in Karelia, even aside from collectivization, the villages were depopulated, partly by people who wanted to move to the cities. This is something that I think has been a phenomenon all over the world in the 20th century, but also partly by officials picking up a whole population and moving them to the city to work, say, in a mica factory. The Khrushchev era, so this is the same time that we call the Thaw, was all about economic progress, and the villages were considered mala perspectively. So they didn't have much perspective or much promise. So here is an old house from one of these villages. You can see not in very good shape. This is not one of the wealthy peasants who lived there. And then here's a whole village. I used this um, funky setup on the PowerPoint because it let me show you more of these houses. So you see that the village is located right by the lake. You can see tracks that somebody has driven through or or gone through with a horse-drawn wagon fairly shortly before the thing was the photograph was taken but but um maybe they're going back to visit the graveyard where their ancestors are buried it's not in fact a living village any longer and there weren't ever a ton of epic song singers and that was it the tradition now exists only in books so let me get back to the folk genres. Another very important one was folk tales. And so thanks to people like Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, who collected folk tales in German in the early 19th century, they had the idea of using them as the foundation of a united German identity. So here's the title page, just because it's pretty, of their first edition, uh, Kinder und Hausmärchen. So it means uh, tales for children and to kind of be told in the household. And it's interesting, by the way, although not a Russian topic, that the Grimm's revised their tales for each new edition of the Grimm's tales, and each time they removed more sex and added more violence. So the Russian Grimm was named Alexander Afanasyev. He was mostly not a collector himself, but he was invited by the Russian Geographical Society to edit and publish some of the hundreds of tales in their archive. And Afanasyev actually was a bit of a folklorist, a cultural studies person, we might say now. He went along the same lines as Max Müller, who was a German professor in the UK, with the idea that if you look at uh, these records of folk um, speech, you're able to discover things about the long ago beliefs of people. Uh, what was it? What was their pre-Christian religion like? What were their beliefs like? But in any case, he had a very good eye for a good tale. He rejected the ones that had been prettied up or um, turned into fake lore, we might say. His publications came out from 1855 to 1867. So that's a good 
50 years or so later than the Grimm's, Afanasyev died in 1871. He was only 45. And so maybe because he had died and maybe just because it was a different kind of project, the tales have been republished many, many times since the versions were um, established in a big three-volume scholarly edition. And each new edition is edited by the top folklorist of that moment. In 1955, that happened to be Vladimir Prop, Michael mentioned, who was the author, most famously for Western readers, of a book called Morphology of the Folktale. And um, anyway, I can talk about that more if you're curious later. And uh, obviously, people came then and picked up these fairy tale plots, folk tale, I should say, folk tale plots, because they're not all fairy tales, and used them for a variety of purposes. They used them again to to um, create other kinds of artistic works, paintings, opera, literary works, and they've had tremendous influence on Russian culture. Even though there are other collections of fairy tales, folk tales, it's really the Afanasyev ones that are like the Grimm's, the the basic ones. They're read to children usually read and not told. And um, I don't know whether any of you have children, but I found when I was telling stories, sometimes I would tell a story and they wanted it to be the same every single time. But in terms of fairy tales, I really wasn't able to, and I would read them if they wanted a fairy tale. They had also the huge impact on illustrators, especially the fairy tales. And um, in Russian, the term is volshebnia skazki, which means literally magical tales. And we know them in English because they begin with once upon a time and they end with happily ever after. In Russian, the wonder tales, that's the official um, name for fairy tales used by folklorists, begin by saying Zhrili Bwili. And this is an interesting long ago past tense form that's no longer used in the language, although it exists in some other Slavic languages, kind of like the way we said had been, right? It's a past past form. And often the uh, wonder tales end with the teller saying something like, and I was at their wedding too, I drank beer and mead, but it ran down my mustache and didn't go into my mouth, hinting that a drink is needed or you need to help him wet his whistle. And obviously this would be a, a man telling it with women not having mustaches, but fairy tales were told by women as well. And in that, that period I mentioned after Peter the Great kind of split off the aristocracy, it wasn't the case that they had no contact with peasant culture. The contact, though, that they had was usually with the nanny or the nurse taking care of the children, because the na nanny or the nurse was used to taking care of children. That was something you did in the village. Often the oldest sister would become a kind of nanny for the younger ones when the parents were out harvesting. Imagine farming in Karelia, where the day is um, very long in the summer, but summer is quite short, and so you have to be out there for the 15 hours um, mowing or reaping or planting or any of those things. So um, the these uh, noble Russians, uh, I will say noble, although it just meant they were more wealthy, they could afford to have a nanny or a nurse, came to associate these tales with the peasantry and with children. So the idea that folk tales are really intended for children and not for anybody else was not true in traditional culture. There are quite a few tales that are really not something you would tell to children, not just because of the violence, but because of sexual content, because of making fun of Orthodox priests, because of making fun of civil authorities, right? So that becomes, that becomes an issue. But in any case, it meant that children grew up with a great fondness for the classic tales. So here is an illustration, and I want to thank Michael Pirikriastov, who supplied this image. It's from the library in Jordanville. And this is um, from a pre-revolutionary collection of animal tales, and uh, it was done by S.M. Dudin. I don't know too much about him, but I'm struck by how the style of the illustration really looks familiar. Um, if you know Russian, I invite you to take just a moment and look at any of these lines. You'll see the letter yait, which looks like a lowercase b in English with a nifty little slash across the top of it, or the hard sign at the end of all of the uh, masculine nouns. So underneath the fox holding the little, um, it's essentially the gingerbread man, although in Russian it's a loaf who runs around and, and fools people and, and teases the animals and then the fox finally gets him. It says, Ya ot volka ushol, 
So notice the hard sign there. This is how we know it is pre-revolutionary. Here are some pictures by the famous Ivan Bilibin, and Bilibin is very well known. So I can tell you his dates are 1876 to 1942. And he was very often inspired by folk tales. This is again from the library in Jordanville, a couple of costume designs he did for a production of Tsar Sultan, and this was 1929, based on Pushkin's fairy tale in verse. So I'm not going to talk about um, Pushkin's fairy tale in verse particularly, but it's an example of folklore being processed by an elite writer. Pushkin didn't particularly have a, a rank. He wasn't a count or a prince or anything, but definitely from an upper class family. And um, then Pushkin becomes the source for a number of Russian operas. If you think about it, the Queen of Spades, um, Eugene Onegin, um, Boris Godunov, right, are all based on works by him. It took a while. Oh, Ruslan and Yudmila as well, Glinka, the first Russian opera that's really stuck in the repertoire. Here is another picture by Bilibin. This is earlier, and this is from Tsar Sultan, the folk tale. So the hero and his mother have been sealed in a barrel and thrown into the sea. And here we see the barrel being carried a little, a little, um, interesting kind of almost Japanese look to it. So the illustration at that point, on the one hand, is being influenced by worldwide artistic trends, but on the other hand is picking up stories from Russian folklore. And, and this is, um, you can see from the bottom that beautiful repeating pattern, obviously from a publication. And here's another Bilibin picture from a publication, and it's the Frog Princess, Tsaryavna Ligushka, and uh, dated 1899, right? We can read the date next to his um, printed signature there. So clearly this is for, from a publication. It opened the top page of the text of this story. The old fashioned Cyrillic, you might notice, but it's completely legible. It's modern spelling, but using kind of an old fashioned font set, we might say, legible to anybody who's literate. The patterns around the edge recall a medieval manuscript, but they don't look like a medieval border. The pictures are quite different. The frogs at the top have a kind of an Art Nouveau look to them. And if you look down the sides, there's a kind of a chicken pattern, and that resembles embroidery, Russian folk embroidery that was done on um, aprons usually or um, ritual towels. So we see in the, in the image, to get back to that, the Tsar's three sons. As the tale opens, they're told to take their bows and shoot arrows, and then go find wives where the arrows land. So the oldest son marries the beautiful daughter of a general because his arrow landed in their yard. The second son marries the beautiful daughter of a merchant, I believe, because the arrow lands in their yard. And the youngest one, poor Prince Ivan, shoots into a swamp and has to marry the frog he finds there, although she does turn out to be more than a talking frog. It's a little like the frog prince in English. So there are other interesting genres and proverbs and sayings in Russian folklore. They tend to be the most conservative kind of folklore. And so one example that I've always hated is kurica ni ptica, baba ni chalavyak, meaning a chicken's not a bird and a woman isn't a person. Uh, on the other hand, they can get replaced by new ones. And then the new one perhaps becomes part of uh, oral folklore. So imagine some old relative you have saying, saying something that calms them down or sums up the wisdom. So I found this nifty um, format online with five different proverbs. The first one says, if you like to ride the sled, then you better like driving the, the, the sled, the sleigh. In other words, um, you like to have your fun, you'd better be good at the business part of it too. The second one means if you're afraid of wolves, don't go into the forest. Or um, if you're scared of things, you're not going to have um, certain kinds of experiences that might be good for you. The third one, very, very practical peasant one, prepare your sleigh in the summer and your wagon in the winter. So make sure the repairs are done in the north of Russia, but really in most of um, the Russian, what's now the Russian Federation, the snow would fall in the winter and it would just lie there. So it was actually very practical to travel by sleigh or on cross-country skis if you didn't have the money for horses and a sleigh. In the fourth uh, example, 
um, zimoy sniega ni voy presir, means essentially somebody's too mean to give you, too stingy to give you snow in the winter. They have an overabundance, but they're not willing to share. And the final one, sa svini murelam v ryat, trying to sell pork in the baker's row. So you've kind of come with something inappropriate to the place where you are hoping to do business, but it's not going to work out. Another wonderful folk genre is called primiatli, and these are signs or omens. Some of these exist in any culture, but the Russian village had a very elaborate system. So, for example, if you drop a knife, it means that a man is coming to visit because of the gender of the word knife, nosh. If you drop a fork, it will be a woman because vilka is feminine. I was in a village once doing field work, and there was a young man who was our videographer, just graduated from college, and the nice old village woman who was treating us to tea um, poured some. He finished his cup, and he held out his teacup for more when she offered, and she said, you can't just hold out your teacup. You have to pick it up on the saucer, because if you just hold out the teacup, you'll never get married. So the two things have to go together. Uh, other kinds of... Um, sayings, or pretty miatli could say that things are just for good, it's like it's good luck. There are certainly things like this in Western culture. If you sit on the corner of the table, it might mean that you're not going to get married if you aren't married yet. So in any case, these are still alive, but there's not a single central system of beliefs. Um, here's another one that I found online while, while preparing this talk. If a woman bangs her elbow, it means there's a man who is in love with her. So you bang your elbow, you hit your funny bone, be consoled. There's, there's, there's really a good meaning in there. And um, finally, if you break crockery, if you drop a plate or break a cup, it's supposed to be good luck, which is why forcing things, you might break them at a wedding. But in any case, it, I think, consoles the person who has done the damage and maybe regretting their beautiful plate and another genre that is still alive, and here I found a big one and put it on the slide, are zagavori. And these mean charms in the Harry Potter sense, or spells might be a translation. It's another genre that's both alive and productive. I went to find a fun example online where zagavori are posted by researchers, but they're also posted on the websites of women's magazines alongside the astrological forecasts and so on. And I got over 7 million hits on Google when I entered the word zagavor. But the problem is there that the word means both the charm, as I said, or a conspiracy. So a lot of the hits have to do with um, websites about conspiracies. Oh dear, I didn't go there. But um, in any case, the people who use these charms without first looking on a website, people who actually still have them, often will just call them slava, which just mean words you say the right words, or depending on the content, they may say malitvi, which means prayers. These um, charms don't look orthodox. They just put in the names of saints, or they mention God's mother, along with the usual formula. So these things are used for health purposes. They come prepared against all kinds of things that might go wrong with your health, toothache, bad cold, lumbago, fever, etc. They can be used for love, and here's an example for love that I'll come back to in a moment. Or you can put someone off the person they fancy. So when would you do that? You would do that if someone were pursuing you and you weren't interested, or if you had evil intentions about the beloved of someone else and you wanted to put them off the other person so that you could make your move. Um, they're used for psychological ills. So example, for longing, you're pining for someone and it's just not going to work out, or you're pining for someone who has died because the village belief is that once you're dead and buried, people should observe the ritual time, the 40 days, but if they continue to mourn for you, continue to come and cry on your grave, it disturbs your spirit. And so there are charms to help get over this longing for someone who has died. There are charms for money, of course. There are charms for good luck when going to court. And that tells us something about the traditional Russian approach to the justice system, that it's really kind of up in the air and a matter of chance. And so these, I'm, these are recorded really as long as people have been recording the charms. There are charms for protection when going to war, and then for good luck on exams. So there's a whole kind of student folklore. Unfortunately, when I went back to Russia as a researcher, I was out of the, um, out of the age group where people might have shared them with me.
So here is a love spell from a website. It's pretty classical in form. It has both the ritual opening and the amen at the end. So I imagine if you know Russian, you've been reading along, and I'll just quickly translate it. I lie down, servant of God, referring to himself, I, uh, praying. I get up, uh, blessing, blessing myself. I will wash my face with dew. I will wipe off my face, dry my face with the most fancy um, cloth that we have. I will go from out of the doors into doors, out of the gates into gates. I will come out into the empty field, into the green beside the sea. I will stand on the raw earth and I will look towards the beautiful east as the beautiful or red sun is rising and shining. It um, bakes the moths and mosses and the swamps and the black mud and so may run to me and dry out God's servant feminine and uh, N desiring me God's servant N. So the N is obviously where you put the names in. Um, eyes to eyes, heart to heart, thoughts to thoughts. May she be unable to sleep and may she be unable to go strolling. Amen to this word. So this is not a typical, typical one, but it's got a very long uh, introductory section before he finally says, bring this woman running to me, let her be pining away for me, drying out, right, would be the way you would describe somebody who was so poorly that they needed to um, kind of get their life together. So these have apparently been getting shorter over time. When literacy began to spread in the Soviet period, there was an effort to reach out to older people, to peasants out in the villages, and to create little educational opportunities for them. And so people, as they gained literacy, especially older women, would take these little titraid notebooks. And so the titraid looks like if you are from the era where you did exams in a blue book, the blue book looks very like these titraid key. And they're named because they're folded four times. So you get 16 pages or 32 sides of pages. And so tetraid, the root is from Greek tetra. So they would write in them both the prayers they remembered from church, because the churches were getting shut down, but also the family store of Zagavori. And the reason why these things had been recorded so early was that literate people wanted to use them as well. And so here are these old women wanting to be sure they don't forget them. They've realized that writing is, in fact, the cure for forgetfulness. It's a way of passing them on to the younger members of the family. Um, there were all sorts of beliefs about how Zagavari worked, about how a person should maintain their efficiency, and what to do with them when you were approaching old age and death. So um, Apparently, the original belief was that each of these came with a spirit who would kind of carry them out for you. But you could not risk telling uh, one of these to a person younger than you, because that person then would acquire the spirit, or at least the effectiveness of the Zagavur. And so when approaching old age and death, people would write them down and give them to someone, or they would summon a younger family member. They would kind of look at them all and figure who's going to be good at this, who's going to be able to, to repeat the toothache charm over me with my bad teeth right now that I'm too old. Um, having lost a lot of teeth was also a sign of um, not being any longer a valid carrier of this bunch of folk magic. Also, children who were too small to have their adult teeth, the milk teeth that children had, were considered um, insufficiently um, significant of having good health and kind of the power that would compel this spell to go into action. So, one folklore genre that has stayed lively for all of history is the joke. So here is one that's still alive in any circle of Russian society. And it's also a piece that lets you know right away how a tale teller might lengthen or edit a tale while they're telling it. So even though folk tales in Russia are no longer, for the most part, a living genre, you can imagine if you hear a joke from somebody, you'll tell it differently to a child, and there are particular kinds of children's jokes. You'll tell it differently to your grandmother or to a coworker or to your best buddy. 
And of course, there are some jokes that you would never think of telling to certain kinds of people. You edit it without even thinking if you're a good joke teller. And also, you know how to stretch it out. You know how to turn it into a shaggy dog story. You know how to pull back if you have to make it quick. So here is one that I actually read about, and I've put it in the present tense to make it feel more conversational. So I'm going to read this one. Stalin and Roosevelt are taking a break in their negotiations. So this is sort of towards the end of World War II when Roosevelt is getting old, but he's still on his feet or in his wheelchair. And they start to discuss during this break whose assistants are more loyal and obedient. Stalin says his are, and he suggests that Roosevelt tell his aide to jump out the fifth floor window. Roosevelt shrugs, and he asks his aide to jump, and of course the aide refuses. Then Stalin asks his aide to jump out, and the man immediately obeys, splat. See? Says Stalin. And Roosevelt protests, of course my aide wasn't going to jump. He was thinking about his family. And Stalin says, so was mine. Right? So here's the subtext being, of course, that Stalin would come after your family if you did anything bad. Now, what's extra fun about this joke is that the exact same joke, or a very similar joke, was told about Peter the Great and some Western potentate he met with in the early 18th century. So Peter dies in 1725. So this is more than 300 years before this joke was put together in its current form. So you get a lot of recycling. Now, of course, if you told the wrong joke in the Stalin period, you could be arrested and shot. And you had to be very, very careful who you told jokes to. And yet they continued to percolate under the surface, maybe telling them only to the person you most trusted. And the joke or um, the slightly longer funny story that Russians call an anecdote, sounds like an anecdote, right? It's a genre that lets people bond over a shared understanding and lets them let off steam by laughing. So jokes seem to be particularly important when things are really bad. You get um, jokes about the most surprising things. If you're interested in this topic for Russian culture, there are several books by a professor who's a scholar of that topic named Emil Dreitzer. He's a professor at Hunter College in New York City. Here's one taking penguins to the movies, ethnic humor in Russia, and making war not love, gender and sexuality in Russian humor. So he is a good joke teller, but he's also made a practice of collecting these and analyzing them. And so I had an example to wind up with of ethnic humor that I heard while I was researching in Karelia. Um, here's a tip if you're ever doing folklore research, that if you say, do you know any jokes, you're not likely to get as good a return on the question as you'll get if you say, oh, I heard this funny joke, let me tell it to you, because that will remind people of jokes that they know. And the same thing with the zagovori, these um, little charms that are used for health purposes. And uh, in any case, here's the joke that I heard in Karelia. There is a Finn and a Swede, and the two of them are distant cousins, and their relationship hasn't ever been super close, but they have a tradition that every New Year's Eve, they get together on the border of Finland and Sweden, and they have a spot not far from where they both live on either side, where there's a big stump where a tree was cut down. And each year, one of them brings a bottle of vodka. So this year, it is the Swede's turn, and he has a bottle of some high quality, obviously, this is going to be really good stuff, and he pulls out two little shot glasses, puts them onto the stump, and he pours, fills them both up, caps the vodka, picks up his shot glass, and says, skull, to which the Finn responds, do you want to drink or have a conversation? So here is you know, the humor, obviously, is that Finns are not very loquacious. They don't have a lot to say. It's also kind of digging at the fact that some Finns, like many Russians, are um, too fond of alcohol and they want to get right to it. They don't even want to say cheers. But in any case, there's an example of ethnic humor I actually have not yet read, Taking Penguins to the Movies. I don't know whether it's in there, but knowing Emil Dreitzer's work, I'm quite sure that it is a wonderful uh, example. All right, and that is the end of my prepared talk. I cut it a little short because I hoped, given folklore's general interest, that you would have uh, questions, but I've put here at the bottom, I'll pause for just a moment, put here at the bottom my email address just in case there are questions later on that come up.
So let's jump right into the Q&A uh, session. So first of all, we have a question from Margaret who is asking, what is the difference between folktale and fairy tale? Mm -hmm. Well, there's not much of a difference between folktale and fairy tale. A fairy tale is a particular kind of folktale, and I always say it starts with once upon a time and it ends with happily ever after. Prop's theory, here's Vladimir Prop, uh, is that the fairy tales are a relic of adolescent rites of passage. That in fact, um, that's why they all end with marriage, because the point is you're making sure that the person is prepared to marry, that they're sufficiently grown up and have sufficient skills. And the skills involved in a fairy tale can be magical skills, right? You find a pair of seven league boots or something that lets you overcome whatever the challenge presented. Or on the other hand, that you have real usable skills. So often the heroine in a tale will have to do something like spin a certain amount of yarn or weave something or pick up all of the dirt out of a bunch of poppy seeds. And so it's kind of peasant skills, even though the characters are sometimes princesses and princes. The other kinds of fairy tales, not fairy tales, sorry, the other kinds of folk tales include animal tales. Um, so in the case of Russian uh, animal tales, the bear Mishka, right? Mishka is always the bear and he's big and strong, but dumb. And then the fox um, Lisa is little and crafty and very smart and fools. The wolf is also kind of dumb. So the a peasant drives by with a wagon full of fish and the fox jumps up and knocks off some fish and the wolf catches her eating the fish. And he says, where did you get those? And she says, oh, I, I put my tail in that hole in the ice down in the lake. And you just put your tail and wait for them to grab on. And so the wolf dummy goes and sits and puts his tail down and he sits and sits and then his tail is frozen in. And when the peasant women come down to get water, they they beat him with sticks and finally he tears his tail off as he runs away. So very different type of tail from a fairy tale. You have the cumulative tales where somebody grabs a turnip and they can't get it out and someone grabs them and someone grabs them. That's not a huge group, but those are also familiar. And, and there are a few other kinds. So distinct from the wonder tales or fairy tales. Thank you. And uh, following up on the book recommendations, um, we have two questions that are related. So one, uh, Emily is asking, I would love to know suggestions for English translated collections of Slavic folklore stories. Uh, she has taken a course in university, but sadly lost the course pack. Um, so mm -hmm. in, in addition to the ones that I mentioned, uh, for which I will be provide, providing the links, what other recommendations do you have in terms of books and, and English publications? And George is asking, or first of all, he is saying, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And what films can one rent based mm -hmm. on Russian folktales? Mm -hmm. Two very good questions. So that third volume that I edited was translated by a man named Jack Haney. And Jack Haney did the entire three-volume Afanasyev. So you can get Jack Haney's books. They're from University Press of Mississippi, if I remember right. And um, they're beautifully, I don't know how expensive they are, but I imagine probably rather expensive. If you're interested not in the whole thing, but in a survey of maybe the most popular Russian folk tales, the um, the one that we use to teach, I could hop up and grab the, maybe I will when you ask the next question, hop up and grab the, the edition I have. Um, there's a translation by Norm Guterman, Norman Guterman, that dates from the late 40s with an, an afterword by Roman Jakobsen, of all people, the amazing linguist. And so that goes through, not in a particularly helpful order, but you can find a lot of Russian fairy tales there. And because we use it in classes, not just here, but at many other institutions to teach Russian fairy tales, you can often get a copy from Amazon for that's used for a very decent price. We also have a question from Margaret who's saying, are there any books on charms in English? So I thought I'd oh, throw that in there as well. Yes, there is a book by a man named Will. <laughs> I would have to hop up and grab it off the shelf. Um, about Russian magic, there's a wonderful, oh, there's a wonderful anthology by, edited by Christine Warabek, W-O-R-O-B-E-C, really Varabiats, but, but um, goes with that spelling, and Valerie Kivelson, K-I-V-E-L-S-O-N. So that actually has, it's a wonderful introduction to all kinds of Russian magic. So that would, if you can get it from the library, um, that would give you insight into all those things. In terms of film versions of Russian fairy tales, there are some very poor versions, I think. 
that sort of smash together all of the characters. So you get Baba Yaga showing up, played in drag, of course, right? It's a panto role. Um, being friends with Liashri, the forest spirit. I didn't talk much about the nature spirits. That's another interesting aspect of Russian folklore that that um, nature has is, is very populated. There's a forest spirit and a field spirit and a water spirit um, that one of the scholars who works on Russian traditional culture as an anthropologist has commented, you think it's all traditional and cute until you're out in the forest by yourself and you realize you've lost your way. And then you think, oh, maybe I should be careful what I'm saying. And so in terms of the films based on Russian fairy tales, I would say go to YouTube and find something that looks not stupid and then pursue that. Speaking of movies, Tanya is asking, what about the movie Bogatir by Disney? I'm not familiar with that. I don't know if you are. And then uh, Barry is asking, can you talk about the influence of animation? I'm assuming like multfilm in preserving the folklore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, just typing those names into the chat. The um, influence of um, animation, probably very, very interesting. I have not... Um, I grew up with very poor vision, and so I'm not really a film person. I just never got out of that front row and um, we're per continued to pursue it. But uh, Russian animation, Soviet animation was fabulous, and there's been quite a bit of good animation since I'm sure. Uh, the the stories I know about are like um, Hedgehog in the Fog, Yozhik v Tumanye, which isn't really folklore, although it's folkloric. It's set in a you know, very quiet film for early childhood, but that adults also find really moving. I haven't seen the Disney one. Yeah. I haven't seen the Disney one. Who knows? You know, I would have said before, but Disney has been surprising me <laughs> since my children were small that some of the Disney stuff is coming out and it's very good. But I don't know. I haven't seen that one uh, because I'm past the point where I'm watching it because my kids want to watch it. Sure. We have a question from Douglas who is asking, how much did folklore vary by geography? surprisingly less than you would think that um, those Zagavari I mentioned were really found in similar forms in a lot of different regions, which suggests there was some kind of common source, although I don't know, you know, we can't know, we can't know what it is. In terms of the tales, there was a lot of variation, but the basic characters, so Baba Yaga is one of them, right? The, here's a book, again, of tales about Baba Yaga from various sources, Afanasyev, but not only Afanasyev. And the, um, uh, her counterpart of masculine gender is Kashche Bismiartli, which means Kashche the Deathless. And he's kind of a, a skeleton, but with a very strong libido. And he kidnaps young maidens, and then they have to be rescued. So he kind of plays the role of a dragon, in a Western fairy tale, they tend to show up all over the place. And then uh, typically there are things like threes that show up in fairy tales. And they're not Mozart threes where you get one, two, and then ah, three is different and it surprises you. They're exact repetitions. And then again, three daughters, three sons. The youngest son is Prince Ivan, and Prince Ivan is the one who winds up winning. So those things repeat, even though the tales are various. And um, uh, because Afanasyev is such a widely respected and used collection, a lot of the other collections haven't gotten translated, haven't gotten a lot of attention that, that might be from a different part of, of the Russian geographical area. So our next question is from Agnes, and she's asking, how much did orthodoxy or orthodox beliefs play in these tales? It really depends on the teller. So if you have somebody who's a good teller, but they're also very religious, they will throw in something. So it often happens that um, the hero or the heroine steps into a house. It might even be Baba Yaga's house, although less with Baba Yaga, and they bow towards the icons. So that shows up, right? Because that's what the teller did. There are, though, there are also tales where there are no <laughs> no signs of any kind of religious anything. And there are certain kinds of folk beliefs. For example, if you get lost in the forest and you want to call on the forest spirit to help you out, you take off your clothes and put them on inside out, but you also take off your cross and put your boot on it. So you put it on the ground and step on it. And that way the forest spirit doesn't know that you're coming in here worshiping a different set of beings. Hmm. So it's understood as an alternative system. And as long as you don't try to play them off against each other, they don't particularly fight each other. 
And this is again more typical of Karelia, perhaps, than parts of Russia that were more integrated into Muscovite society. So moving into proverbs, Conrad is asking, can you mention any Russian proverbs that co correspond with what we might consider Western proverbs? For example, a chill means that someone is stepping on what will be your grave. Excellent lecture. Oh, thank you. I'm quite sure that there are things like that. And, and I'm not as good with the uh, sayings and proverbs and then the omens as I am with some other things, but it's common to be able to translate a proverb into another proverb just because traditional uh, the, the traditional way of life was a really similar way of life. So um, I haven't heard something like that, you know, repair your sleigh in the summer and repair your wagon in the winter. But boy, would a peasant understand it if they lived in a place that used sleighs. And I think, you know, maybe in Scandinavia. Um, so, yes, absolutely. There are all kinds of these um, omens and and uh, omens that threaten that you might die or that you might get sick all the time. Yeah. So and also. Um, if you have the habit, as I weirdly do, of knocking on wood, kind of performatively, I've said, you know, my son was very ill in his early childhood. People would ask later, how's he doing? I'd say, oh, he's great. Tap, tap, right? So this is to signal to the people watching that I'm not trying to tempt fate. And so we say tempt fate in a mm -hmm. setting like that. But the Russians say zglazit. And zglazit is to put the eye <clears throat> on something. So if I brag that my son is now healthy, it's as if I'm attracting the envy of evil forces. And so touching wood in Russian, not so much. But um, I actually had a professor who came to visit me and I opened my office door. There he was on the threshold and I went to shake his hand across the threshold. And he said, no, no, we can't do this across the threshold. Either you step out or I'm stepping in. Hmm. And, and I thought about why, and I think it's because the threshold is associated with life and death, that you step across and you buried, actually, um, if you step across, you're stepping into a new state of being, but also that Russian houses would traditionally bury their watchdogs under the, the threshold, and sometimes they would bury, like, grandpa under oh. the threshold with the idea that not so much recently, but it's it's been recorded with the idea that the, the watchdog spirits are going to get anybody who tries to get in. Now think about the tradition of the groom picking up the bride and carrying her over the threshold. Why is he doing that? Because there's a similar idea that if she's inside, whatever is guarding the threshold is going to take her as one of ours and she'll be protected too. Whereas if, she's, if they feel her stepping across, they realize she's an outsider and it's not going to work. There's a there's an example of something quite parallel, I think. Although I don't know that in Russia there was a tradition of carrying her over the threshold. I should look into wedding traditions more. So we have uh, a couple of questions that have to do with curses, zagavari, mm -hmm. and more of these um, the the charms, so, so to speak. So Agnes is saying you mentioned something to preserve or restore health. Were mm -hmm. there curses to cause pain or harm to an enemy? Oh, yeah. Something similar to New Orleans voodoo dolls. Um, and then we have a another question about charms from Lena, who is saying, is there often a mixture of re religion and charms? I am aware of a charm of putting up a candle for a living person upside down on the table for the dead um, as a way of getting the person to fall in love with you. Is this mm -hmm. more or less common now? Um, I don't know about the candle charm in particular, but yes, absolutely. There, there is a mixture of using using things in a different way that holy water might be used or blessed water might be used for certain kinds of purposes, although usually a good purpose that um, apparently love charms are incredibly productive. And a folklorist I was interviewing described a young woman telling him that she had created one where she inhaled her cigarette smoke. And then when the guy she admired walked by, she blew it out and said this little charm under her breath that was supposed to attract his attention. I don't know whether it worked, but um, lots of lots of things developing like that. And um, there are bad, bad spells that are meant to um, make somebody pine away and that kind of thing. Here's a quick story that I was told during my research. The woman who told me something big fell on her out of a truck and really, really damaged her leg. And she spent a long time in hospital. And while she was in hospital, there was an old woman who had been one of these folk healers in her village and had passed on all of the spells she knew, all of the charms, except for one, which was a bad one, that somehow someone had told it to her and she remembered it. And now she felt she couldn't die because the demon associated with this spell was tormenting her. 
And no, nobody in this ward, it was a big Soviet ward with lots and lots of beds. Nobody would take it from her. Nobody would listen when she said, please just let me tell you, because they could see, you know, whether it was her imagination or a real demon that she was, you know, flailing in the bed, very good woman. I mean, she, she was actually one of the really Christian ones, this, this woman told me. And finally, one of the others who was very much a believer had all of them take hands around the bed and say prayers, and that eased things, and she died. But, you know, this belief that a bad spell is really not something you want to know if you're a good person explains that there were probably not as many, but definitely, yes, there were curses that you could say to somebody. You could cast a bad piece of health on someone. So Elena is asking, has anyone collected, recorded, or studied the cries of farmers, Russian and otherwise, as they plow their fields? There is the old Russian verb arat, which mm. means to plow, yeah. and it shows up in bulini, but now it means to shout, arala meaning pl uh, meant plow. So it seems that it's uh, th this is something that was done by farmers throughout Europe, but I haven't been able to find much info about this practice or hear examples. Can you shed any light on the matter or point to any literature or recordings? Mm -hmm. And thank you for the fascinating, wonderful. fascinating, fascinating question. And I don't know, I don't know, and I suspect that it would be something that a farmer would keep very close, very close and not tell other people. Because again, if you tell someone else, you might lose the efficacy. But the other thing is during collectivization, these senior farmers, the older men who knew that stuff were the ones who were taken out. And so you wound up with the younger men who were still out fist fighting and not yet married being kind of the, the senior representatives now of how men were supposed to behave. There were definitely things you would say when you let the cows out for the first time in the spring. There were things you would say to get rid of cockroaches. So I'm sure, I don't know whether they shouted them, they may have said them more quietly because they didn't want them to be taken away by somebody else to lose the power. On the other hand, if you're out in the middle of the field, you you probably can. And, and you noticed in the one that I read to you, translated for you, that the guy says, I go out into the empty field. So the field is the place where you imagine doing the magic, whether it's the field that has Baba Yaga's house on the edge right against the forest, or whether it's a field that's actually um, fallow at the moment, so an empty field. Uh, super question, and I don't know. Thank you. Uh, so the next one is from Daria, who also thanks you for your excellent uh, presentation. And her question is, how much are some of the central characters in Russian folklore connected with those in the broader Slavic world? And did characters such as Baba Yaga and Kashe perhaps originate in more West Slavic or South Slavic traditions? Yeah, Baba Yaga we know exists in Belarus exists in Ukraine and in Poland. Her name is Baba Yedza or something like, don't speak Polish, but something like that. I've often thought that Yaga might be related to the German Jäger. Maybe that there's a kind of hunting, you know, she flies, here's the picture again, right? She's flying around um, in her mortar holding the pestle and, and her broom to sweep her tracks away. So the idea that she's kind of a hunter who flies to catch her victims, right? Um, but there, the South Slavic folklore is quite distinct. The the character I imagine in South Slavic folklore is the Vila, and the Vila got picked up for the Harry Potter series. But the Vila would be somebody who would spoil work on a bridge, for example, come and break it up at night. Um, peasant beliefs that the Vila had to be propitiated somehow. The Baba Yaga no isn't found in in that particular kind of folklore. That the Hungarians came in and and broke the connection between. South and West Slavic. Uh, Christina is asking, are there any references to Russian folklore in classical ballet? Oh, yes, absolutely. The um, um, the willies, the vili in um, um, are, oh God, what is the Swan Lake in Swan Lake um, are related to the vile in South Slavic, right? So the idea that you have these female spirits, uh, they're more similar to the rusalka in Russian folk belief, so the, the Rusalka is kind of a water, female water spirit, but might be found in a field. They tickle um, children, they might tickle an older person to death, and they are said to come from uh, babies who die unbaptized or um, women who are seduced and then kill themselves um, because they're not managing to rectify, to regularize their situation. And so the Rusalka is, of course, found in Advorzak, Opera is an opera. 
But um, yes, there are lots of places where the folk characters show up. I'm not sure about Baba Yaga showing up in a in an opera. It would take take quite a voice to sing her sort of a control. <laughs> Uh, we have an interesting question from Elizabeth, who asks, did the Aprichnina during Ivan the, the fourth, Ivan the Terrible's reign, make use of black magic with their brooms and their dog heads? Oh, I'm sure they did. They were so bad. They were so bad. <laughs> they were terrible. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. And, and um, that would be likely to survive in court case testimony. And I'm not sure how much there was from there. Um, I put in the chat the name of Christine Warabek who is a wonderful Russian historian specializing in pre-revolutionary. And she has a lovely book called Possessed about um, the phenomenon of peasant women becoming possessed and, and shrieking, crying out in church. These characters show up a little bit in some of the Dostoevsky novels, but uh, she connects it to the men having to go work so they could pay their taxes, which were now imposed in order to pay for the land that they, they were farming. In terms of Aprishnina, there's a lot of folklore about Ivan the Terrible. Actually, he comes off rather positively in folk tales as this kind of, um, he, like Harun al-Rashid a little bit, he dresses as an ordinary person, goes out into society and then sees how people are doing and, and dispenses his, his Tsar wisdom. <laughs> um, he, he's, he becomes kind of a trickster figure, rewarding the good guy and, and making his boyars buy all of the pottery that the the potter he happened to encounter as he was on the road had, was bringing to sell. So I think we have uh, time for another couple of questions. Um, and Natalie asks, do beliefs surrounding the Domovoi continue to exist? I remember my grandmother had a Domovoi mm -hmm. living in her house. And I wonder if in connection with this question, you've mentioned several times that you have gone to Karelia to do field re research. Could you talk a little bit about that experience when you went, what, what that entails? I'm curious to know, and I'm sure that our audience would be as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, the Mavoy, I think, yes. And it's the same thing that that anthropologist said about being in the forest. You're sitting in a dark room. Imagine that it's a peasant house and imagine the only light is from the fire in the stove and it's going down and it's flickering. Um, they didn't have candles because candles were expensive. They would use a splinter and you might dip the splinter in animal fat. Um, but it would burn down pretty quickly and it would be very smoky. So you're sitting in this very dark room. Of course, you believe in whatever spirit you've been told is in the room. Um, when I was in Karelia to merge into the second part of the question, I interviewed a woman who had worked at the museum in Kiru. And so it was like a living museum that they had people dressed in the traditional clothing and they would just spend the whole summer there. And she said there was a Damavoy in the place where she was staying and she got along with him fine, but her son didn't like him. So her son was already a college student and was no longer going to stay there in the summers because they got Damavoy and he didn't, didn't get along. Yes. So she kind of shrugged, right? Whether, whether there really was one or they were just imagining it. Um, going to Karelia, I had a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities and went for five months. It was from March through August, which is the time to go. That now that there aren't sleighs, getting around in the winter is pretty unpleasant. And when I showed up in March, they were chopping the ice off the off the sidewalks and there were layers like this with just filth, 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 filth. Um, and things weren't melting yet. But the sun was coming in sideways with this incredible brightness. But um, I read tarot cards and that was my in to talk to a lot of people. And then once you know somebody, they can take you to talk to their friends or introduce you to their friends. There was one old woman who um, had emerged as a healer. And when I went to talk to her, she already was very com comfortable with her role as a healer and, and um, took my money and, and uh, said words over the jar. And she would talk in... <laughs> So whispering both on the in-breath and the out-breath, and I asked her, and then she plopped the jar lid on very quickly, and I said, why do you have to um, put it on so quickly? And she said, oh, so the magic doesn't run out. So so um, this, though, was in the late 1990s, and I'm not sure how much of that immediate culture is still left. There was already a kind of trade in people who weren't from the tradition, but who were presenting themselves as um, sorcerers or healers. And um, uh, definitely also in Moscow, there's a book by, I'm blanking on her name, Scandinavian name, who had done some research on similar figures in Moscow, 
which is quite different because they're not from the backwoods. So people told me, if you go to a Russian, they're going to want all kinds of rewards. But if you go to a Karelian woman, she'll take a package of cookies or a package of tea to do the kind of healing that you need. And um, the Russians said, oh, you know, we think that about the Karelians because their coloring is darker than ours. They tend to have dark hair and sometimes brown eyes. And the Karelians think the Russians are better. So I asked some Karelians and they said, no, nope, no, nope, we think that the gypsies are better. The Roma, because they're darker, have more magical punch than we do. There just aren't very many up in Karelia. So we'll wrap up with this question from Margaret, who is asking, are any of your classes on Zoom? Because I'm sure that some of our attendees would like to know more and learn more. So thank you for a great lecture. And uh, is there any way to, for any of our participants to continue to um, learn more from, from any presentations that you have online or, or any classes that are offered online? Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And no, actually, we don't. Um, I mean, I did lectures during the pandemic and they got put out, but they they probably weren't very good at um, teaching the fairy tales course. But I have to say that I recently did a reading of Baba Yaga Tales for the second Tuesday Victor Vince Society in the UK. And I think if you Google me, perhaps that would come up, but you have to pay. It's like six pounds and 99 pence to watch and it's mostly just reading the um reading the tales oh someone mentioned v in the oh daria kirianov hello daria um v a very very interesting character who isn't really a folk character and yet works very well as a folk character gogol really knew where, where he was coming from and it is it's a terrifying film so there you have it. If you want to come and listen to quality speakers, you'll have to come to the Russian History Museum and join the, the second Saturday lectures. So thank you very much again, uh, Professor Forrester, for joining us and for taking the time from your busy schedule to present this fascinating lecture and especially for this super uh, Q&A session. Thank you to everybody who has joined us this weekend. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the month and see you in February for our next lecture.